Hello and welcome to the webinar. I'm, I'm Sean Ryan from SLI Systems and I want to thank you all for joining us here today. We've got a very informative webinar for you on how to maximise your merchandising. So just brief int introductions. I'm the uh, Founder and Chief Innovation Officer here at SLI Systems and I'm going to be your host today. And the, for the real nuts and bolts of the content, we're going to have Jennifer Hale, who is a Product Manager here at SLI Systems, responsible for guiding the product strategy and development for SLI's recommendations portfolio. So just to get started, a little housekeeping first. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologise for the late change of URL. All of you listening were able to find the correct URL, so congratulations. Um, all participants will be muted during our 30-minute webinar. We will be recording the session and you'll get a link to the session via email as a follow-up. If you have any questions at any time, please type them in by clicking on the red Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer them at the end of the session. What you'll learn in this webinar is how can you use recommendations to, to best use, the, to, sorry, to, how can you use recommendations to their best use to minimise the amount of work individuals spend merchandising while also maximising the returns that you see. We, we, we are going to cover some of the best practices and tips for recommendations that you can start applying right away to ensure they are working optimally. We'll also highlight some trends in recommendations, including personalisation and integrating with emails. We'll also cover some examples of customers that we see are doing a great job with recommendations. The title of this webinar is Maximising Your Merchandising. We believe at SLI that recommendations are a powerful merchandising tool. In the physical store, merchandising is about where you place products, what goes on the end of the aisles, what signage or displays you have. Recommendations online are just the same. You'll find your favourite salsa next to the tortilla chips, chips, and it's all about putting additional relevant products in front of the shopper and making the most of upsell and cross-sell opportunities. A quick glance at the IR Top 500 will tell you recommendations are important. But why is this? Numerous case studies have revealed that anywhere between 5 to 15% of online revenue can be attributed to recommendations. This is backed up by the experience of our own customers who have seen an average of 10% increase in click-through rate and an almost 5% increase in average order value. It's also validated by Amazon, which devotes almost 75% of its homepage to recommendations. In fact, a look at any of the IR Top 500 sites and you'll see recommendations front and centre of their homepage and throughout the rest of their site. Here are some examples of top retailers using recommendations in the extremely competitive online retail landscape. Recommendations have moved away from a nice to have to a critical capability. Um, here's Target on their product description page showing two sets of recommendations. Uh, Walmart on their homepage showing recommendations based on your history. And Staples showing a, a set of recommendations on the right hand side. As I said before, Amazon's homepage is up to 75% recommendations and they present multiple recommendations throughout the shopping journey. The year they introduced recommendations, they saw a 29% sales increase and at one point they attributed 35% of purchases to recommendations. I'm now going to hand over to Jen to go into some of the more details of putting recommendations to the best use. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, so as Sean said, I'm going to give some best practice tips for your recommendations and also highlight some customer examples. I do have a lot to go through today, um, but as mentioned before, there is going to be a recording made and that will be available to you afterwards. I just wanted to start as well with just a bit of uh, background on some SLI terminology that I will be using. Uh, so we call the actual block of recommendations on the page a strategy, and that's made up of a combination of algorithms and merchandising rules. So the algorithms are the actual calculations happening um, in the background. For example, looking at people who bought this item also bought this one, or what are the top sellers. 
And then merchandising rules go on top of that, and they place restrictions on the results. Um, so we can combine, confine results to be maybe to a particular ca category or maybe within a set percentage of the price of the, the initial reference product. So again, that strategy is really a combination of algorithms and merchandising rules. Now, just to start off here, I wanted to um, put a poll out to the group and see where do you have recommendations on your site. So you should see some options here on your page, uh, and you can select multiple ones of them. So the options are on the home page, uh, category page, product page, cart page, or maybe you don't have recommendations on your site yet. And the, you can use recommendations in many locations on your site, but these are probably the most common. So I'll give it a few more seconds uh, just for everybody to make their selections, and we'll, we'll see what the results are after this. So I'll just close it off in about three seconds. So three, two, one. So that's great. So 100% on the product page, 12.5% um, on the home page, uh, and 25% on the cart page. And it looks like everybody here ha does have recommendations. So that's great. So I just wanted to give you some context in and show actually compared to the IR1000. Um, so you can see. Again, the product page is definitely the majority, but even in the IR1000 is definitely the overwhelming majority, but not everybody does have recommendations yet. But you see the product page has 70%, and the home page and the cart page are almost even there at about 44%, and the category page at 15%. Um, so when you are looking at implementing recommendations, you do want to focus first on the locations on your site that are going to provide the most return. Uh, so I will say that definitely um, everybody here and the ones at the IR1000 are getting it right. Um, you do want to definitely have them on the cart page and the product page. Those are the locations definitely that we see that contribute the most revenue. Uh, the home page is also a good location. Um, you get a lot of new visitors coming there, and this is a way to encourage them to keep discovering your, your site and going past the first page. Uh, as well, category pages. So I saw nobody here has them in the category page, but they're also a really good idea um, just because they are sort of pit stops for buyers. Um, they've sort of determined a general idea of what they're looking for, um, but they might need a bit more direction, and recommendations can highlight those that are most likely to interest them. So those are page locations, but now just getting into some best practices on the presentation, the location on the page is also definitely a critical factor. So I say location, location, location. Uh, you can have amazing intuitive rec recommendations, but if nobody sees them, uh, then they aren't going to generate any revenue. So the further down they are on the page, or if they're below the fold, that is going to be, mean that they are viewed by less shoppers, and that is going to negatively impact on their engagement. Uh, you also want to make sure that you maintain style consistency uh, and allow for other important information to display on the page. You do want them to be seamless with your site, um, but you do need them to stand out. So you don't want them to blend into the background, but you need them to stand out so that people understand this is a block of recommendations. It's not just some additional images for the, the product page that you're looking for. Um, you do have to work with the space that you have, um, so you can also work a lot with vertical placements um, when you have that restricted space, but it does depend on what your overall site's styling guidelines are. And you really want to make sure that you have clear messaging, what the purpose is of the recommendation and why it's relevant to the shopper. Uh, I think if people understand why they're being suggested products, um, something such as, you know, those people, people who bought this shirt also purchased this, they, they're more likely to consider it maybe versus a generic message such as you may also like.
Now, the number of um, products on the page, we actually only recommend that you show four or five products on desktop and three on mobile. And the reason for this is you're actually allowing the images to stay quite large, um, and that usually is the main attraction for shoppers who will get their, their attention or interest them. Um, showcasing more products doesn't always tend to increase engagement. So we do see, um, just in general in the industry, people putting on a lot of carousels, but they do typically have low interaction. Um, they are making the shopper go through extra steps to see more products. So if you focus primarily on presenting, you know, four or five extremely relevant products, that's your best bet to getting the shopper to click. And then along that line uh, of more is not always more, um, people do ask about what about having multiple blocks or multiple strategies on the same page. Um, for example, a product page might have two strategies of so showing similar products, but also complementary ones. So maybe customers also bought this one. So they do have very different goals and they will appeal to different audiences. Uh, you do want to be very clear what the difference is between them. Um, and sometimes having multiple strategies can sometimes increase the overall click-through rate, um, but each block, as I said before, should have a particular audience and purpose and be clearly differentiated um, what they're there for and have clearly different products in them. So sort of an exception to this, though, is recently viewed. So recently viewed um, can pretty much go on ev on every location and in addition to other strategies that you have. Uh, it's a very simple strategy, but it's very effective that we see um, at almost any point in the shopping journey, helping people get back to what they've had interest in before. So keeping it simple. Um, so as I said before, keeping the images large, um, minimizing the number of products that you show. Uh, you do want the image to, to be the hero and have the focus. And you don't need all the details related to the image that you might show on the search results page. Um, when you're there, you might show the price or maybe what the original price was, the SKU, the long title, the manufacturer. You don't need to usually go into that much detail for recommendations. Um, people are really look. they need to be interested in, at a glance. So a lot of times just having the short title, an image, and a price is all that's really necessary. And you don't want to take the text, the text to take away from the image size. Uh, you only have so much space to work with, and especially when you are trying to get them above the fold, that's very prime space, so you want to make sure you're making the most of it. And the, the final point I had just for the presentation side of things is to make sure that you optimize and consider it as a separate case, really, for desktop, tablet, and mobile. Um, going back over all those previous elements that I mentioned, uh, you want to analyze each one of those as pretty much a, a separate case. So, for example, it, you may not have recommendations on all of the pages on mobile that you would on desktop. You also want to check the image size and maybe even further reduce the amount of text being shown. And you also, again, how much scrolling is involved, how far down the page are the recommendations is also going to be key. So now just looking at how you decide what types of products to show. Um, I think a good part, uh, good part to start at is actually identifying what you hope to achieve, achieve as a business. And this can also help you identify locations to, to place the strategies and which ones to focus on. Uh, so recommendations in general are very effective at increasing average order values. So you want to consider whether you're wanting to actually increase the number of items in the cart, which is cross-selling, or the price point of the items being bought, which is upselling, uh, or if you're looking to reduce bounce rates, increase time on site, or, or whatever that goal is. Then once you decide what you're trying to achieve, you can actually work back from that point, look at what algorithms you want to use, and then what data they're going to need. For example, if you're wanting to increase the number of items in the cart, but right now everybody only purchases one item, then you're not really going to have the data um, 
to help you automatically determine the add-on items. So this is also where you look at fallback. So when we construct a strategy, it's made up of several algorithms. So if one algorithm doesn't have enough data, then you look at what, the, what it falls back to to then provide results. Now, um, another major challenge to designing the right strategy is making sure that the right recommendations are shown to the right to the shopper at the right time. And so, when you're looking at what type of products to show, um, I think the easiest way to do it is to put yourself in their shoes um, as they're working through, you know, from coming onto your site all the way through to the cart, and asking yourself what kinds of recommendations are going to be useful right at this moment. You want to make sure that the type of products match what they expect, and a lot of this is going to be driven by the page that they're on. Um, for example, so somebody who's on your home page could be at the very start of their journey or doesn't know anything about your site, and you want to maybe show them new or popular products. Whereas when you're on the cart page, this is your, your final opportunity to suggest additional products like warranties or batteries or care products that complement what they've already said that they want to buy. So there's a, a lot on this page, <laughs> but looking at the different types of pages, as I said, that will drive a lot of how you decide what types of products you want. So on the product page, they're very interested in that product. They've obviously selected it maybe from the search results or navigated there, but it might not be exactly the right fit. So we usually suggest in this point to show alternatives that they might be interested in. So you can show things that are similar in terms of attributes using your catalog or you can actually use visitor behavior to suggest those ones that were maybe subsequently purchased after that product was viewed. We don't usually recommend that um, you show complementary items when you're on the product page because the shopper hasn't uh, necessarily decided yet if that is the right product for them. So add-ons might not make sense at that point. Um, of course, there are exceptions, so I say this um, as a sort of complete the look. So if you sh the page itself might be selling the shirt, but you've shown a whole outfit, um, it might make sense in that um, scenario to actually link through to the other products that are shown. Now on the home page, um, you're going to see both new visitors and returning ones. Uh, for new visitors, you want to show them what's most likely going to interest them, but you don't know anything about them. So you're really at that point using the wisdom of the crowd to show them the most popular products, maybe top sellers or what is trending. Uh, for those that know your website and have just typed it in, you want to let them maybe get back quickly to the products they were looking at last time. So here again is a a chance to use recently viewed. Uh, and you can also highlight maybe new products uh, and use personalization to make them relevant to that person. So if they've shown interest in Nike shoes, you can actually show them these are the new products from the Nike category when they come to the home page. Uh, the category pages, people, as I said, have sort of nar narrowed down what they're looking for, but there are more options and subcategories that they can further refine on. So you can also make it a bit easier for them uh, by showing top sellers or the new products in the category. Uh, and again, you can add personalization on top of that to make it even more targeted. And then in the cart page as well, the, those people are at the end of the journey, they know what they want, and they're ready to purchase. So you're not, uh, you're trying to keep them on track to completing the, the purchase, and you don't want to distract them. So you definitely don't want to be showing them alternatives to what's already in their cart. Um, they really need to be encouraged to complete the sale. Um, but you can show them add-ons that are specific to what they have in their cart, and also a small but simple and effective trick is just even adding a buy now button there on those types of recommendations and have that buy now button automatically refresh the cart. Um, just again, helps keep them on track. So also on how you decide what products to show, there is the, the learning from the visitor behavior. You've got the right locations and styling, um, but you want to make sure that the recommendations are staying relevant and are adapting over time 
um, so that they're always right for that particular mo time moment in time <laughs> when they're being shown. Uh, so you want to make sure that trends, maybe in style or color, uh, and products that people are purchasing is captured. And as well, you know, as the seasons change or the holidays approach, there are different types of products um, that maybe should be suggested, and you can learn that from visitor behavior. Um, but of course, you know, trying to stay on top of all that activity and how it it impacts each recommendation is really impossible to do manually on any sort of scale, which is why you're looking for automation and machine learning and those sorts of solutions. Um, you also want to make sure that you're testing all the elements of your recommendations. Um, so keeping them fresh, looking at the styling, um, where they are on the page, what logic is being used, and making sure that you are continually checking to see that you have got the optimized solution for your site. Now, of course, automation is, uh, you know, is the ideal solution, but there is always going to be those instances where you want to fine tune the results or perhaps use uh, rules unique to your business. Uh, maybe you have a promotion with a particular supplier you want to feature or an item you want to clear out. Um, but really, these instances, you want them to be the exception rather than the rule. And we find that customers do tend to buy what they want <laughs> to buy and not necessarily what the business maybe wants them to. Uh, but if you do want to do manual tuning, and it, it is going to probably happen at some point, it is better if you can figure out a way to do this in a more light-handed fashion. Um, so maybe a manual a manual intervention, but maybe incorporating automation or wisdom into, of the crowd into it. Um, so this is where I talk about, you know, the mapping versus a curating approach. So with curating, you're being very specific. So maybe for this blouse, I want to show these four particular scarves. But if you look at the mapping level, you can say, if I'm in the blouse category, then show me the best-selling products from the scarves category. And that mapping approach is just a lot more um, flexible and allows for changes in the product catalog. So if you create those manual tunings, they're, they're sort of set for infinity unless somebody goes to, to change them again. Um, and also, you're relying on somebody being there and maintaining them. And you have to make sure that that person is there who understands the tuning interface, has the time and the energy to always constantly being in that maintenance mode. So you can craft, you know, these clever strategies and, and using the algorithms and making sure they're lear learning from site-wide behavior, but really the ultimate step in making sure that they're the right products for that moment for that individual is personalization. Um, and if you can make customers feel like an individual, that what you're showing them is really exactly what they are looking for, and it's you know easy for them to purchase versus having to to look for what they're wanting to find. That is definitely an experience that's going to stand out for them. Um, so not only are they going to be more likely to buy, but they're going to remember that feeling the next time they have to purchase something. And when the experience is amazing, they're more likely to share it as well or recommend maybe a site to friends. Uh, and simple personalization does go a, a very long way. So just looking at this Accenture survey, you can see anything from recognizing their name uh, to recommending products based on their past purchases or knowing their purchase history, uh, all made shoppers more likely to purchase from a retailer. So just any one of those options and 75% of people said they'd be more likely to purchase. So not just personalization, but you do also have to be able to adapt and learn between and during sessions um, to understand context. So different users might share the same laptop at home, uh, or maybe somebody is doing shopping for their entire family for Christmas at one go. Um, really, the personalization solution needs to be able to identify the changes in context uh, in real time and be adapting those recommendations accordingly. Um, so, but that isn't the, true for necessarily all personalization solutions. So, um, you know, even 
the big ones like Amazon do get it wrong sometimes. Uh, so actually, this is a screenshot of Sean's recommendations, which I'm going to let him explain. Yeah, so I think this is a common problem for a lot of people, but I find when uh, I go to Amazon, I always get recommendations based on purchases that my wife has made. And so this is a screenshot of what I saw just the other day um, of um, based on the books that she, she buys, uh, and they're not relevant at all for me. And and so even someone like Amazon can get it wrong. And, and what you want to do there is look at the context. I mean, my wife and I access Amazon on different devices. So if there's if there's activity that's stored um, that's associated with the device that's stored in a cookie, then you can personalize it, the recommendations to me based on my activity and my past uh, purchasing behavior. Um, so it's, I think it's really um, reassuring to know that even someone like Amazon can do a really poor job with recommendations, at least from the point of view of me when it's been based on other, other people using my account. Great. So just looking at um, recommendations as well, you want to make sure that you're using them to the full advantage. So thinking outside of your site and where can you use them actually off your site as well. So in-store kiosks, um, they can highlight trending or top selling items, maybe even close to where they're located in the store. Uh, or maybe if the shopper is searching for items on the display, it can show items related to that. Um, as well, printed receipts, so you could feature add-on items related to what they've just purchased. So um, Barnes & Noble, this, I thought this was interesting, they do this really well. Um, so I, I'd seen this myself when I, I bought something previously. It says you may also like and suggest some other some other um, books to, to buy. But when I actually looked for this image online, I couldn't believe how many people had <laughs> actually posted their Barnes & Noble receipts online to Reddit, to all these um, different forums saying, this is actually amazing. And that's, you know, that's fantastic publicity for them for such, you know, a simple um, solution. Uh, as well, you know, mobile applications can feature products within them. And of course, you know, probably the most common other use of recommendations uh, other than the site is including them in emails. So just a highlight of some best practices uh, for email recommendations. You know, this could probably be a whole uh, webinar topic just in itself. Um, but just at a high level, here are some of the, the guidelines that you want to consider. So I think the first point is actually that recommendations aren't needed in every email. Again, you really want to focus on the experience for the customer and what, what actually makes sense and what matters the most to them for that particular message. Uh, styling is very important, so you, again, you want to look at those previous presentation elements I mentioned before, uh, how prominent the recommendations are. They, again, you're just showing a select few relevant ones uh, with large images and maybe no unnecessary text. Uh, and as well, most emails are opened on mobile devices, so you do need to make sure that it is going to be um, optimized for viewing on mobile. Um, then for every type of email, uh, whether that's, you know, order confirmation or abandoned cart or shipping confirmation, uh, you want to design a strategy that's unique to that type of email and is delivering the type of products that make sense really in the context of that message. Um, so example, in the cart confirmation email, again, it's like being in the cart on your site, you don't want to show them alternatives. You don't want to make them doubt the item that they just purchased. You want to show them complimentary ones. And then I think varying the, the types of the emails, um, having a variety, different, having different types of content, really just in general is a good idea for emails um, just because it doesn't get stale with the customers and is a way to make sure that open rates stay high and people stay engaged. And just like the recommendations on your site, of course, measuring and testing, looking at the open rates, the click-throughs, the purchases generated, and making sure that you are uh, doing some ongoing testing of different strategies. Uh, and then, of course, personalization, uh, it's the same. Just for like on-site recommendations and sites in general, personalization is really the best practice. Um, so Experian actually looked at the open rates of emails that just had a personalized subject line. And they saw adding the shopper's name 
saw increases of open rates of 13 to 40 percent. So that that is huge, and um, personalization does have a very impact, a uh, very big impact on people. Um, but again, as I said before, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, and there are different levels of personalization. And again, keeping that um, type of content fresh for for um, customers is very important. So I, I think there is definitely uh, a use for all these different ones. So really, the general email is one that you send to all shoppers. So you might want to show maybe the top selling products or what are the t trending products. Um, the segmented ones are sent just to the select portion of customers, and you're defining them uh, by their profile, so maybe their gender or their location, or by their actual activity. So you could define a group as maybe those that have purchased multiple pairs of Adidas shoes, and then when you add Adidas clothing to your catalog, you send an email with, with those top products. And then there's the, you know, the highly personalized emails that are unique to every single shopper. So those, again, are the maybe the abandoned carts, the shipping confirmation, the cart confirmation. Uh, so in the example of an abandoned cart, you can maybe suggest items that are similar but are marked as on sale. Because marking something on sale does um, definitely have uh, an impact to people that, that does – make some of them cross the line and it doesn't even have to be an item that was necessarily cheaper than the original one that they considered. Um, so as I said, I think every type of those personalized emails does have a use and it's varying those kinds of, of emails which is going to keep um, customers engaged. Um, so now when you have your recommendations, you want to make sure that you are measuring um, how they are working on your site, and looking at that over time as well. So revenue is, of course, the one that people do focus on the most. Um, so that's including conversion rate, the revenue, average order size, and average order value. Uh, you do want to break it down by strategy so that you can evaluate how each one is performing. Um, and you also want to be aware, though, of how each number is, is calculated. Um, so, you know, GA does seem to be what a lot of people do use, but there is sampling that goes on there. And also the session model can be different between maybe your, your recommendation solution, so you will see some sort of difference. Um, so it, SLI, for example, we're very specific how we attribute revenue for recommendations. So by default, we only count when a shopper clicks on that product from a recommendation block and buys that exact product. But that's not the same for, for all solutions. So you do want to make sure you know how your numbers are being calculated. Um, then there's overall site metrics um, that are also worth evaluating, but they might not be attributable to any one particular strategy. So this is looking at the time on site, the bounce rate, the number of pages viewed, and the amount of returning visitors. And for those revenue ones you or engagement, if you're looking at each industry, individual strategy, you are definitely going to see a difference between them. So here I've shown sort of the conversion rate and the click-through rate sort of in the descending order that we normally see on them. So the cart page usually has a lower click-through rate, but it has a very high conversion rate, uh, whereas the product page has a much higher click-through, but overall a lower conversion. Uh, home pages do ha tend to have very low click-through and conversion rates, and category pages are somewhat in the middle there. And then, of course, once you've looked at um, what your statistics are for each individual strategy, you do want to make sure that you uh, are completing the loop, so identifying, again, those aims that were critical to your business and seeing, thinking about that in terms of what strategies you're using and testing out new ones. Uh, I do get asked quite often, what is a good number? Um, and that really is going to depend on the type of site you have and the sites of strategies you, you're using. Um, sometimes with being very strict on revenue, um, it does seem like a, a lower conversion rate. So we do tend to focus on the cart and the product pages because, as I mentioned before, they do contribute the most revenue. So I'd say we usually say somewhere around 10% click-through rate and 1% conversion rate on the product page being sort of a minimum acceptable benchmark. And with cart pages, you're looking at more like 
5% click-through and conversion rate. So this was just to, to highlight an example of what we saw was one of our customers, Michael C. Fina. Um, so they actually put recommendations and looking in the first 60 days, uh, an average of about a third of their customers who saw the recommendations were clicking on at least one of the products shown. So, you know, the they are very good at um, getting customer engagements so that's not directly tied to revenue, but it is showing that people are becoming more engaged with your site, which is also incredibly important for getting them to return. So I wanted to step through uh, pretty quickly um, some site examples from some of our customers who I think are doing some interesting and some really good things with recommendations. Uh, so this is Oriton. Um, they're an Australian customer of ours and I think they've done a, a great job on their product page. Uh, it's very clean, uh, the recommendations, and very clear even though they're using two different strategy types. Um, but really it's the fact that it fits in with their site styling. Like it, it doesn't look like a, a plug-in or an add-on. Um, um, and I think it's also interesting, you know, the alternative products, they title it, you'll also love. And that's just giving it that personal touch to connect to customers. And they also sh are showing other tote bags. So again, it's very relevant to the page that you're on. Uh, also something interesting that they're doing uh, on their checkout page. So if you're signed in, it actually knows your first name. And the first product that it's recommending there that's, that's circled is uh, they always show you a charm because you can personalize their bags with a charm. And they show your first initial. And so here I'm signed in actually as our Australian CSM Kevin, um, which is why it's showing a K, but um, I thought that was a really uh, clever use of what they know about the customer. And they also say it's the top picks for you. So again, it's emphasizing that really personalized experience. Uh, now, this is another customer of ours, Footwear Etc. Uh, so they've done a really good job uh, on the checkout page, just mapping product types to the various accessories. And also, not just that, but ensuring there's really a mix of products. So for this uh, men's shoe, they're not just showing all insoles. They're showing insoles, they're showing waterproofing spray, and they're showing protector. And they're really clear, you know, in their title as well, that the products shown are based on what is in, actually in the cart. Uh, now, this is Noel Leeming, uh, another... Um, Australian, New Zealand customer of ours, um, they show recommendations on the add to cart pop-up. So I don't actually usually recommend that people do this because most of the times add to cart pop-ups are very small and if you're showing additional products there, it does happen that shoppers get confused and think that you've added, added items to their cart um, without them asking you to. Um, but for them, their cart, their add to cart pop-up is actually quite large, and so they're able to clearly indicate that the items are only suggested to be added on. Um, also, the so they say, did you forget to add this to your cart? So they actually show the recently viewed items. Um, so you, again, you can quickly link people back. And when there aren't three of those available, then they, they fill that with complementary items to what's in the cart. And they've also added those add to cart buttons again to so that um, visitors can quickly add the products in. So this is an example of Noel Leeming's um, product page. So I think this is, again, just looking at how they're using space very well. Um, they sell a lot electronics um, and appliances. So they do have to show a lot of the specifications and details by default. Um, so rather than putting the recommendations underneath all of that information and near the bottom of the page, they've made them vertical here to get them as high on the page and as visible as possible. And this last example is really a specific use case uh, and is something we actually call dynamic product banners. 
Um, so they're actually a band of recommended products that only show on the product page when the shopper has arrived there directly from a search results page. Uh, so we know people devote a lot of time and resources to the visibility in, you know, in Google. Um, but on the flip side of that, it's very easy for people to just press the back button and go to the next site down on the list. Um, but when you're showing some additional products for those visitors, you're essentially increasing the the chances that one of those other ones might be what they're looking for or might interest them and keep them on the site. Um, you do, of course, want to make sure that they're very relevant to the page uh, that you're on. Um, but it is, it seems very simple, but it is very effective approach. Um, so one of our clients, Superet, they actually saw a 50% lower bounce rate when they started incorporating this, um, this strategy. Uh, so just to summarize, Again, as I said, I probably uh, talked quite quickly and covered a lot. There will be uh, the email link with the recording available. Um, but there are, I, I just wanted to go over some of the main points. So there are some very simple elements you can look at and, and that you can change right now uh, that can help your recommendations uh, improve their performance. Uh, you do want to focus on the experience um, versus algorithms and data, um, and you want to make sure that it makes sense for the shopper at every single point in their journey. You also want to make sure you consider the audience, so not just the type of products you show them, but also how do you title and present them in a way that's really authentic to your brand. Uh, you need to consider what device they're going to be viewing the recommendations on and adapt everything accordingly. Uh, you don't want your recommendations to get stale, so again, not relying on manual controls. You want to make sure automation, machine learning, site behavior, and personalization are really doing the hard work for you. And you should also consider places outside of your site where you can use your recommendations solution. And of course, for every aspect, you want to always be accurately measuring your performance, um, testing new ideas, and learning from what your results are. If, well, thanks very much, uh, Jennifer. And, and that brings us to the end of the webinar. We do now have, well, and we have gone a little longer than our allocated time. And so I actually won't take any questions right now, but we will follow up with you directly um, for any questions that you do have. Um, and I'd just like to take uh, this, this, this moment here to thank everyone for attending the webinar, to thank Jennifer for the fantastic uh, content that we have. I hope, I'm sure you've all learnt uh, a lot about the, the, what you can do with recommendations uh, and, and have got some thoughts that you can take back and use on your site. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone and we will wrap it up there. Thank you very much. <laughs>